කුඩියෙන් භාගයයි කලක් පවතින අලුත් වෙනුවයි Tonight, first mile post in touching distance. 18 to 30 age group to be vaccinated from mid-September. We are very much there to achieve that target. Relief. Sri Lankan experts say that the three Delta mutations aren't a threat. Importance of the balance. The risk of lockdown to SMEs articulated by leading entrepreneur Dhamika Pereira, while State Minister Cabral emphasizes the importance of returning to normalcy. Our macro fundamentals would weaken, and that would mean that Sri Lanka's overall recognition as a growing economy would be damaged. Unhappy. Former US President criticizes the incumbent over Afghanistan troops handling. He's now overseeing the greatest foreign policy humiliation in the history of the United States of America. All that and much more coming up on First at Nine, this Sunday, the 22nd of August, 2021. From Adha Verana, this is Adha Verana First at Nine. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening. Welcome to First at Nine. I'm Dham Kekanai. Now then, as Sri Lankan health authorities are on the verge of successfully inoculating the country's target of over 30s with one vaccine dose, authorities have announced the next phase today. Chief Epidemiologist of the Epidemiology Unit, Dr. Samitha Ginige, said that persons between 18 and 30 years of age will be immunized from mid September. Meanwhile, the country confirmed 183 COVID-related deaths yesterday, while 4,282 new COVID infections have been confirmed so far today. It is also the first time that the island confirmed a daily caseload in the excess of 4,000. Even though the world is slowly inching towards completing two years of a global pandemic in the form of COVID-19, there is still no silver bullet against it. Instead, Vaccination is supposed to be the best tool in the shed when it comes to combating the virus. But with the emergence of new COVID variants, there are suspicions over that particular tool losing its sharpness. You know, when the clinical trials for many of these vaccines that are currently in use were done, Delta was not the major variant that was circulating in the world. And in any case, the vaccines that were studied were looking at symptomatic disease and particularly severe disease as endpoints. Because Delta is so much more transmissible, we do see these breakthrough infections occurring in people who've received both vaccines. But if you look at the outcomes that we are really concerned about, which is severe disease, hospitalization and death, those are clearly being prevented by the vaccines and that's true for Delta as well. There are studies now looking at what happens over a period of time because there are so many moving parts. We have the variants that are changing. There are different vaccines in use around the world and of course each vaccine could have a slightly different immune response. There are all the other factors which people are uh, experiencing through social mixing which is encouraging the, the transmission of the virus. So I think the bottom line is that the vaccines that are currently being used that are approved are still protecting to the tune of about 90% or more against the severe disease outcomes, while breakthrough infections, mostly mild, are occurring. And this is why masking is so important. And there's been some recent modeling done to show that even in countries with high vaccination coverage, everyone wearing a mask will help drive down community transmission much faster. Globally, it has been well documented that a majority of COVID fatalities occur among persons suffering from underlying health conditions and those above the age of 60. In Sri Lanka, the situation is no different as the epidemiology unit cites that 75.72% of overall COVID fatalities to have taken place are persons 60 years of age and above. With that being said, with those above 30 years of age are more at risk from contracting the virus owing to the country's working population being among it. Chief Epidemiologist of the Epidemiology Unit, Dr. Samitha Ginigay, today gave an update on the country's vaccination drive and assured that the first target in the vaccine drive is not that far away. 
country's objective is to finish about 30 with two doses by end of first week of September or mid-September. I think we are very much there to achieve that target. By now, with the single dose, we have covered nearly near 100% coverage with about 30 and the two dose coverage is somewhere around 48%, about 30. But considering the total population, total population, our first dose coverage is somewhere around 55%, two dose coverage is 25% of the, our total population. But still, when we go into that, our mortality data, we have seen still deaths are widely occurring among non-vaccinated people. 91% of deaths are among unvaccinated people, but another 8% among the people with single dose vaccination. That's a key message. Then other thing is nearly 77% of our deaths are occurred among above 60 category or another 70% people with the known comorbidities or chronic medical condition. That's why it's a clear message. If you want to reduce the deaths, we have to achieve this target above 60 coverage has to be achieved. Now we can see 91% of the deaths are among non-vaccinated people means still there is a vacuum. A certain number of eligible people above six years are not vaccinated. There are different reasons, but even your family members are vaccinated, still there is a possibility they can carry the virus and they can transmit the virus to the people who stay at home. If you delay the vaccination, you may regret later. They are getting vaccines free of charge. Everyone get the opportunity. Above 60 category, always get the priority in the vaccination process. Please take this opportunity and vaccinate. Now that the health authorities are nearing the complete vaccination of over 30s and are also focusing on immunizing over 60s, what next? Some countries, especially in the West, have already launched programs to administer a third shot of the vaccine against COVID-19, known as a booster shot, to their people. Not wanting to be caught out, President Gothabe Rajapaksa too instructed officials to procure booster shots. But the stance on the Global Authority on Health on the matter is rather different. Uh, we believe clearly that the data today does not indicate that boosters are needed. Uh, we need to know which groups, at what period after the vaccination and which particular vaccines people have received in their primary course. No vaccine is 100% effective. And if you have high vaccination coverage, you will, of course, always have cases, breakthrough infections, or what we also call primary failures, where the vaccine actually doesn't work. That is normal, that occurs, and the proportion to which this happens may differ from vaccine to vaccine, definitively. And then comes the other topic, which is the issue of waning protection. And that basically means a decline over time. Now, the first thing is that we actually have pretty little data on this. And so we are certainly gathering more data. There are some pieces of information that have come out, which indeed suggest some decline in protective efficacy. In relation, however, and that's the important point, in relation to mild disease and infection, we virtually have not seen a decline in relation to the really most important objective that we have, namely the prevention of severe disease. In the meantime, despite the prevailing quarantine curfew, the vaccination drive is moving forward. 120,449 vaccinations had been conducted in the island yesterday. The army also carried out their mobile vaccine program targeting people in the western province suffering from underlying health conditions who are unable to make it to vaccine centres. As of last evening, 12,088,864 persons, a large chunk of them above the age of 30, had been partially immunised. From that, 5,620,254 persons had been given both doses of a vaccine against COVID-19. As for one of the hottest topics at present, the availability of medical oxygen in the country, there is very good news. 100 metric tons of medical oxygen purchased by the Sri Lankan government from India reached the island's shores today. It was carried aboard the Indian naval vessel Shakti. On Friday, 40 metric tons of the oxygen donated by India also arrived in the island. There was another piece of good news from a medical expert in the country about the three mutations of the Delta variant discovered in the island. Professor Nilika Malavigi at the University of Sri Jayavardhanapura says that the mutations in question pose no threat against vaccinations. She noted that the mutations had not occurred in the areas of the Delta variant's gene where it gives it the advantage of evading vaccine-induced immunity. As the police has tightened its surveillance with the ongoing curfew, they request people to extend a degree of understanding during spot checks. 
Meanwhile, the 2,000 rupee allowance for families which have lost their livelihoods within the Colombo district due to the curfew being imposed last Friday is set to start from next week. The entire country was under lockdown for a second day today, with police on roads, with strict surveillance, to ensure that people will remain within the boundary of law and support the government's efforts at this hard time. <laughs> However, for some people, it was too much of an ask. Some people were found out while attempting to cross borders sans permission during the day. Steps were also taken to warn them before they were turned back. The police are also urging people to extend an understanding when it comes to police officers executing their duty during the curfew. In the meantime, the government announced yesterday that a rupees 2000 allowance will be given to those who lost their livelihoods due to the quarantine curfew. Accordingly, the distribution of the allowance for the people in the Colombo district is set to commence in the coming week. Colombo district ke adala jiono pa ahimu paul sandha rupees jada ka e adimana wala ba jima sandha rupees million harasya hatta hatak pradipadana dana tamat maaveta mahabanda gare visin yomukar lati no dana tapi andhuna gane tiye no muli ka wate jiono pa ahimu cha udgeling delaksha panas dha gara adika pisa kapi andhuna gane tiye no me piri seta elembene satiye tuladi jimana wala ba jima tak katutu aram bakar no. Meanwhile, State Minister of Advanced Technology and Agriculture Shashindra Rajapaksha stated that all dedicated economic centers located island-wide will reopen on Tuesday the 24th of August as well as on Wednesday the 25th for wholesale trade. Minister of Agriculture Mahinda Nandarud Gamage meanwhile explained that a mechanism to distribute agri-products via the district secretaries by providing necessary permits has been set up. Now then, State Minister of Money, Capital Markets and State Enterprise Reforms, Ajit Nimad Kabral highlights the importance of getting back into the economic activities as fast as possible following the end of the prevailing curfew. He says that the lockdown has left millions without livelihoods and the country's economy is also massively impacted by the move. In the meantime, leading entrepreneur Dhammika Pereira notes that the lockdown runs the risk of bankrupting the SMEs, which in turn, he says, will destroy their future. Curfew. Lockdown sounds ominous. It exactly means that no movements allowed and certain liberties suspended. But it is done for the benefit of the very people whose freedoms are restricted by the curfew. In other words, to stop COVID-19 from spreading any further. The health aspect is simple enough, but there is more that meets the eye. Confined to their houses, millions of daily wage earners will be left without any means of supporting their families. What's more, with the economic activity slowing down, the country's economy also takes a hit. The bitter truth is that unlike some countries around the world, Sri Lanka cannot have a lockdown for months. Whilst we do understand that there is a massive health need, there is also the other factors that could be adversely affected as far as the economy is concerned. We have greater sympathy for those who have lost their lives as well as those who are ill with the COVID situation. But at the same time, while we sympathize, we got to also understand that there are thousands and thousands of people who could otherwise be adversely affected if this situation were to continue for a long period of time. One of the biggest problems that we would face if we have a prolonged lockdown is that our macro fundamentals would weaken and that would mean that Sri Lanka's overall recognition as a growing economy could be damaged quite significant. That is why in order to maintain our GDP as well as to ensure that our economic factors are considered in the benign levels, we got to bring back economic activity as fast as possible. That's a tough call. We also got to understand that there are thousands and thousands of people who are badly affected as far as their livelihood is concerned. 
Yes, lives are very important, but so is livelihood. If the livelihood is not going to be looked at sufficiently and people are not going to be able to carry out their livelihood, how will they ensure that their loved ones are protected and looked after? How will they pay the rent? There are more than 45 lakhs of small and medium sector entrepreneurs who are living with resources that are limited and they got to have the country opened out in order for them to carry out their businesses. So it's going to be a tough call for them. That is why we need to ensure that this period is reduced as much as possible. And that's one of the reasons we need to keep the economy going if we are to sustain ourselves for the future. One of Sri Lanka's leading businessmen, Dhammika Pereira, is also of the view that the economy must run for the country to sustain itself. Lanka we raje gatto, then raje adam giaurude billion ekdas thonsi ay. Habe raje save ke oki na kailatam billion ekdas ekasi akoni. Itto kotha thava billion desi ay itru elati ani. Na meka depatta raje adam tiagan na thoni. Minisunge, Maranagana, Adumasanka, whatever in Naton, it may they get balanced Kernekatamai at the Tama, Rajaka Karanasi de Velatin, it would Sampunum Ratavahala, Raja Duan Mani, then for the example a gatto, a pitter, petrol, diesel, Kiripiti ticker, may Okom import Karano, it would import Karananang, a peaker export Karano, it would export Karala, dollar revenue, Natang Ratata, it would make a cut gain a ban, tourism mulling, billion Hatara Marak, Nativatin Ratata, it would a billion Hatara Marak, Nativate. Ratakata, Tavat, Natikaragan, Be, Godak, Minisu, emotional in it. It got a Raja Kadiata, Eva Druskaranatoni. It got a Tava Ekatamai, health sector, health sector, Katama, Kuhama, Egolo, me dividend, Majantavin, at the Himo Dipu at Kutrino, that. By eight, better than one, me patient La Balagan. It got a Egolo, E. Kriava Kerno, a gamer, Tavat sectors, Tina, make a Kuhum Harikala Vedakarnega. World Economic Predict Kala Tina, Suluparimana. However, Bankolo Tino making. Mother Rata lockdown Karagamang, Isselam Bankolotina Kalatamai, Air Podi Katiabe, Ego Latamai, Tabau, the Hayaka di Loku, Ayavedni, the Aminisumapi, Sampuno, the Patkam Dadradano. We will see you shortly. Bear with us. Big Three. Now, the foreign ministry has expressed its deep concern about, about Afghanistan's current situation and the Sri Lankans there. It says that while 46 Sri Lankans have been evacuated from Afghanistan so far, it has requested the US, UK, India, Pakistan and the United Nations to help evacuate 20 more Sri Lankan nationals awaiting extraction from the turmoil struck country. Issuing a statement yesterday, the foreign minister said that the government of Sri Lanka is deeply concerned about the situation in Afghanistan and that it is closely monitoring its developments. The statement read that the primary concern is the safety and security of Sri Lankans living in Afghanistan and evacuating them to safety or back to Sri Lanka. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs has requested the government of USA, UK, India, Pakistan and the United Nations to assist in evacuating the Sri Lankans in Afghanistan should they desire to do so. During meetings, Foreign Minister Professor G. L. Pires has requested the assistance of the relevant envoys to assist the Sri Lankans in Afghanistan and said that the government is ready to provide whatever facilities needed in this regard. 46 Sri Lankans in Afghanistan have been evacuated from a total of 106. As such, 20 Sri Lankans are expecting to return from Afghanistan and the Foreign Ministry is making arrangements for the evacuation. Meanwhile, 20 other Sri Lankans there have expressed their willingness to stay back in Afghanistan. The foreign minister said that the government is happy to note that the Taliban has offered an amnesty and promised not to harm any foreigners and request the Taliban to continue honouring that commitment. It also noted that the government is pleased to see the pledges given by the Taliban that the women in Afghanistan can work and girls can go to school following the Islamic tradition. The government also takes note in the pronouncement made by the Taliban that an all-party mechanism will be established to take the country forward. Now that the Taliban is in power, Sri Lankan government requests that the law and order situation be stabilized and that the safety and security and dignity of all people in Afghanistan be safeguarded. It however remains concerned of the possibility of mass migration, extremist religious elements attempting to find a safe haven and enhanced illegal narcotic trade which can have a destabilizing effect on the entire South Asian region. The statement also added that the government is keenly observing the situation on a daily basis and that as a member of the SARC, Sri Lanka is prepared to play its role to assist any regional efforts in this regard. 
In other local news, MP Rashad Badiuddin is once more under the spotlight for all the wrong reasons. A doctor at the magazine prison where the MP is remanded has lodged a complaint with the police alleging that Badiuddin had levelled threats against his life. The Colombo Crimes Division has launched investigations into the matter. A doctor serving at the magazine prison has lodged a complaint at the Borella police station yesterday over a death threat levelled against him by parliamentarian Richard Badiuddin. As per the complaint, parliamentarian Badiuddin had obstructed the duties of the doctor while he was treating an inmate on the 15th of this month. Then the doctor had allegedly asked the MP to wait outside for his turn. The parliamentarian, who was then allegedly furious about it, had said that the relevant doctor's services isn't needed, as he is calling a doctor acquaintance of his. The MP had then allegedly threatened the doctor, saying that he is capable of having him transferred while also threatening to end the doctor's life. Badudin had allegedly gone on to say that he has parliamentary privileges and is treated well by both the government and the opposition. The threat has also extended to the point that the MP has allegedly asked the doctor to find a good place to hide. The relevant doctor had lodged a complaint after informing the chief medical officer at the prison and a senior officer at the prison both verbally and in writing. Following a written complaint lodged with the IGP of the police commissioner, the Colombo Crimes Division has launched investigations into the matter. Accordingly, the relevant doctor was summoned to the Colombo Crimes Division this afternoon and statements had been recorded. Meanwhile, a special police team from the Colombo Crimes Division visited the Colombo Magazine prison today and inspected the location at which the threats to the doctor were allegedly levelled by MP Badiuddin. State Minister of Cooperative Services, Marketing Development and Consumer Protection, La Santa Alegiwana, says that domestic liquid petroleum gas cylinders will be released to the market without any shortage from tomorrow. The State Minister made the remark while speaking to the media following an inspection tour of the LAFS gas filling station in Mayambima. There had been a shortage of domestic LPG LAFS cylinders in the market during recent days due to the suspension of its production. State Minister Alagivana said that with the approval of the government to increase the price, LAFS has been releasing gas to the market at the new price since the 20th. Now then, market analysts expect the index to be volatile in the week ahead due to the lockdown imposed over the country. They forecast mixed sentiment from investors due to drive the Colombo All Share Price Index both up and down during the week. Last week, the All Share Price Index closed 0.24% lower to end at 8,240.06 points, while the S&P SL20 Index of more liquid stocks gained 1.57 points to close at 3,048.64. With that is Dimantha Mathi with a more detailed market forecast for the upcoming week. The upcoming week is going to have a bit of volatility mainly because now we are going into a lockdown period and that might affect the investor mindset as to how the earnings are going to be in the current quarter. So there could be a mixed sentiment among investors. So with that mixed sentiment, we feel that volatility will be there in the market. So throughout the week, you can experience mixed level of sentiment. So you will see the SPI moving up and down over the week. We don't think there would be too much of a moment. The SPI is likely to move within a tight range during the weeks, mainly because that there is uh, buying interest also coming into the market, especially into the dollar income companies. We feel that there could be a bit of change in attitude towards the investors, where there could be some investors looking for bargain hunting in this time period as well. Now, former U.S. President Donald Trump launched a sustained attack on President Joe Biden's handling of the retreat of U.S. forces from Afghanistan yesterday, which he called the greatest foreign policy humiliation in U.S. history. Trump, a Republican who has dangled the possibility of running again for president in 2024, has repeatedly blamed Biden, a Democrat, for Afghanistan's fall to the Islamist militant group Taliban. Biden failed totally on the pandemic, and he's now overseeing the greatest foreign policy humiliation in the history of the United States of America. This is the greatest humiliation I've ever seen. Biden's botched exit 
in Afghanistan is the most astonishing display of gross incompetence by a nation's leader, perhaps at any time that anybody's ever seen. Name another situation like this. Vietnam looks like a masterclass in strategy compared to Joe Biden's catastrophe. And it didn't have to happen. All he had to do is leave the soldiers there until everything's out. Our citizens, our weapons. Then you bomb the hell out of the bases. We have five bases. And you say, bye-bye. This will go down as one of the great military defeats of all time. And this is not a withdrawal. This was a total surrender. This surrender for no reason. As for Afghanistan's president who fled the country allegedly with a vast sum of money, former U.S. President Donald Trump had this to say. So we had a deal where we were going to get out with great honor and they weren't going to play games. And we had to meld it in with the government, but I've never been a big fan of Ghani. I always said he was a total crook. I've said it for years. It turned out he was a crook. He was a crook and he left. He fled. He fled. Double Olympic champion Elaine thompson Haraya has come within 0.05 seconds of the women's 100 meters world record set by American Florence Griffith Joyner back in 1988. She ran the second fastest ever time in the event at the Eugene Diamond League yesterday, crossing the finishing line in 10.54 seconds. Elaine thompson Hera, who completed a 100 meter to 200 meter double for a second successive Olympics in Tokyo, came within the touching distance of breaking the decades-old women's 100-meter world record at the Eugene Diamond League. The existing record, 10.49 seconds, was set by Florence Gifford Joyner of the U.S. back in 1988. And yesterday, Elaine thompson Hera ran the distance in 10.54 seconds. After the race, thompson Hera said she even surprised herself at Hayward Field beating another double Olympic champion, Shelley Ann Fraser Price and Sherika Jackson, who finished third to repeat the Jamaican's Tokyo podium sweep. Now, after nine days of parading the streets of Canada, the final Randoli procession took to the streets this evening. The procession has a great fame for attracting large crowds with both local and foreigners. However, for the second year running, the COVID-19 pandemic meant that people had to be kept at bay this year as well. And that's it from all of us here at First at Nine. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.